Hey, it's Sanfa and Young Scully. And we're here. I want to show and tell the Liblast framework work in progress. I have the CVAR system working. And yeah, this video is to document that and show how it works, how to use it. And yes, yeah, Kali, if you have any questions, interrupt me. Uh, actually guide me like what you want to know. Okay. Okay, so we are in the core. This is the first script that the Blast framework does. Like this is how you start up the framework. You have a scene with with a node. You give it the core script, and if that's that scene exists, it's gonna spawn everything else. So if I hit F five, this is what we get from the core. So what the core does is when we switch to the remote tree, you see that the core spawned a lot of nodes. These all are so-called core services. Most of them are placeholders, stubs. What are not placeholders is commands and CVARs. These two actually do stuff. The rest for now is placeholder. And our core also spawned the main menu. And the main menu is this thing here. So I'm going to track this away. And all this spawning happens in here in the init method. I don't want to go through it everything. But what this does is it finds scripts in a specific directory where all the core service scripts are. And these are in Liblast framework, core services. And here is all the service core service scripts. So the core script goes through all of these, tries to instantiate them in their own nodes and make them give them everything they need to to operate. And everything they need is Every one of them needs a so-called LFA token, which I'm going to explain in a second. And also, it needs to know about the services. Mm. Actually, just some of them need to. Right, so the LFA token is part of the security system, which is there to try and um, make it so it's not so easy to like break the game or break break things you're not supposed to break when you're just making a mod or a mutator for the game so it's an attempt to a little bit harden the, the entire framework make it a little bit more difficult to break stuff so you can be a bit more you know creative with your modding and stuff and the framework shouldn't let you break things outside of what mod mods are allowed to do and breaking means like overwriting you know configuration of or like running commands that aren't you know pri privileged accessible right so the init script loads all the services then it spawns the main menu now, after it loads all the services, it then goes through them once more and gives all the services references or an array of references to all these services so that you know every service can access all the other services. This would be a, a horrible thing if this was, you know, a changing set of dependencies because that's that's you know basically intertwined, but the core services are core. And uh like this, the framework will expect all of them to to function, and there's gonna be a minimum number of them. If something is will be optional, it's gonna be excluded and made into not a core service, so that the set of core services is minimal and must be there, so they can all know about each other. Um, 
Right, the core also does a self-test for the security, mostly just to make sure that the security checks and permission, permission levels are make sense and work. If anything doesn't, then it's going to print asserts and it's going to stop the program. Okay, so after all that setup, we have spawn main menu. And spawn main menu loads our menu scene, prepares a node for it, gives it access to all the core services, gives it an LFA token, which stands for Liblast Framework Access Token. So this token is for the menu and it has permission level user. The permission levels are core, user, server, and client. Core is everything. User is everything that isn't, uh, that is user modifiable. So user preferences, user data. Um, the user isn't allowed to like modify, you know, core system settings or, you know, uh, but it's able to change, you know, everything that is configurable. Like if we have settings that include like security keys, the user won't have like permission to do that. The server permission level is for game logic. This is what all the game balance, game modes, mods, uh, and game mutators must operate on. This affects the game state. So to be able to modify the game state, you need to have LFA server level access token. And lastly, LFA client. This is for accessing things that don't affect the gameplay. So yeah. And this distinction is there to like, you know, be able to give server access, but not give core access. So your mods can change the game balance, but can't like change the URLs that you connect to, to, you know, fetch the server list, that kind of thing. Or can't like change your username and password and steal your credentials or whatever. Ditto isn't built for security, but it's, a, it's an attempt. Maybe it's futile. We'll see. Yeah, so these are the permission levels. We've got the main menu. Let's start the game again. And in the main menu, we can do a bunch of things. We can play the game. That's a work in progress state. But we can also do things. I can actually make this more, make this larger. So I can open tools. Ah, oh, we have a sound issue. Huh? I'm going to mute the game. So we can open a console. And this is a console from which you can do stuff. You can, for example, call a command to load the map or start the server. Sorry, that would be host or join a server. And this this console is an interface to the core service called commands. And this, this service ex executes commands which affect the game. So to you know create a game server, you need to tell the commands, hey, I want to run a command that starts the game server. And you also need to give your LFA token. So the commands core service verifies that you have access, that you are allowed to run a specified command and then runs it or refuses to run it. So we have a few, a few commands, quit, exit, clear, play, join, null, toast, just a few. And the game internally uses these commands and this core service to do these things, which means there is a single universal interface to doing these actions. That's very important because it allows us to have different interfaces for it. You can make a UI widget that just runs a specified command from the commands 
core service and as long as you give it uh, uh, reference to the commands core service so it can call it up and give it an LFA token so it can identify or authenticate then it's going to be able to do that so there's not going to be a thousand different implementations scattered all, over, all across the game like the UI starts the game differently but the console does it differently but then if from script you can do it differently no <laughs> it's one way so all of this work is there to cut off a lot of very very big headaches that happen months years into the game development when you like i've been for this <laughs> trust me it's it's good to have as one interface and one way to do these things and yeah that's why we have the commands so that's the commands we can run the commands from the console uh, this also provides a, a native logger that's what that what you scully did what scully did uh, so this reads the, the good old log and it prints it out here. So any errors will also list here. And last but not least, we have our CVAR editor. This is the thing I've been working on for the past couple weeks. Uh, this is the interface to the CVAR system. So the CVAR system is a hierarchical database that allows us to manage uh basically we have like a folder structure for settings so we can divide them by different categories like things for the user are here and we can have you know user display name like let's let's add a cvar called display underscore name give it user default name make it a string uh, user's name to be shown in game and description and we do add to directory bloop. and we've created a new cvar it's called user dot display name that's the full path uh, and every every um every cvar has a path which can be accessed this is like a user friendly or like human readable interface so we can use this in the console the console doesn't support this yet but in the future you will be able to also do you know user dot display name and get the value here or change it here or whatever why is this all there well it's there so we can balance the game while we're playing it and like you know do things like you know change weapon balance without you know releasing a new game build we can you know a b test settings while, while playing a game on the, on the server we can load alternative sets of cvars and you know change how the how the movement works or balancing or whatever and just play test how this feels with people so we have a sim sim central way to manage all the game settings this is similar to how it works how it worked in Unreal Engine 1, 2, 3. I don't know how it works in Unreal Engine 4 and 5, but I, su I suspect it still has a hierarchical set configuration manager. So this is inspired by that. Right, so now what can we do with this? Uh, we have this display name. I would actually set as, as null. Let's try username. Okay, now it works. We can also hit save tree, but that's actually a holdover because the tree is saving automatically if I do some changes. If I do a change, it's going to save and also it's going to wait like five seconds before it saves again to not like spam saves when I'm just typing. Okay, so what we can do with this, uh, we have this display name here. We can make a CREF or make a CVAR reference. So I hit this button, get CVAR ref. And it says CVAR ref code copied to clipboard, paste into the code editor and use CVAR as a regular variable. That's, I need to modify this text because it's not as easy as a regular variable, but it's pretty easy. 
this is just for show. I can, you know, click and it just disappears. But now my my um, clipboard contains some code, some GD script code. So let me open the level that we're in. It's called test map. Yeah, that's not a problem. And you see, this is where we are in the game. If I I deceive our editor. This is the level. So now I've added the script to this label 3D. And I've already done this with a different CVAR, but you can see what I now have in my mm, clipboard is this code. And what this does is it gives us access to this CVAR, which is addressed by the path and by the UUID that is generated. This is important because the path might change later. We might want to remove move CVARs, rename them and stuff. So this might change. But the UUIDs ensure that CVARs are still uh, possible to find and address, even if we move things around. Of course, a user wouldn't be, you know, moving CVARs around, like, you know, <laughs> demolishing this thing, because that would break the game. But still, management of, like, of this kind is, is going to be possible with this. So now we can just use display name and, for example, assign this to our text. Display name dot value. Display name dot setter. So we can use just one time assignment. Let me remove this. So we have our display name. And this is a label for D, so it has a text property and we can just assign display name dot value. So this is one time. I'm going to F5 to reload the game, start it again. And our label now says this. But this yeah. is one time only. But very easily we can make it not one time only. We can make it so it's just linked and it's going to be following that. So how we do that is we do display name dot link property. Now we select what object? Self, because we are now just give the name of the property. Let's give it text. And let's save and restart the game. All right, there's our username. I'm going to make the whole game window larger. Let's go to tools, save our editor, and here's our display name. And we can change this. Wow, very nice. Right. What this means, this means a lot. This has huge implications because this is just some text, but this as well could be the base damage of the rifle you're just holding or the rocket launcher. And you're like shooting targets and you're like, oh, this is like too slow. It takes too, too long time to kill something. You know, you just, you just can type and change it. And because we can so easily use these CVARs, you know, just do get CVAR ref, Paste it on top of your script. Take the name and then take the value for one time assignment. This is good if you're just running it once for in re ready. But if it's something that will be happening more times than one, then you can do link property. So link property, select what object you want. It could be a different object. It could be something from the hierarchy here. You know, any node. And you know you can name. And then any property you can name, like, you know, health. Just, you need to put it in quotes and it add an ampersand to the note. It's a string name. Of course, this doesn't exist, but, you know. So I figured this isn't very very bloated. It's it's probably going to be pretty readable. Of course, these, uh, these can get very long. But hopefully this is still going to be readable if you have you know, one byte per what line. What about um, 
if you have a look in the weapon profile. Ah, weapon profile. Doop. So this has all, if you look at stats, scroll down a little bit after the right. sounds. So this yeah. has all these, like, obviously this is like pair weapon. Mm -hmm. But like, as each weapon is defined, if you go, if you if you have a look back in your C bar editor in the project in the run in the running yeah like yeah we I'm, need to I'm, I'm imagining where it says assault rifle and rocket launcher like each weapon will be named there and have its own and then you could make these off the weapon profile rather than like having to like get the reference and. All that stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think it would be possible to like make an interface that the weapon profiles are exposed via CVARs. Because you can know we can create these CVARs and yeah, we could add add CVARs that are like not saved to disk, which are like in an interface to something else. So mm -mm. program. Of I mean, this is still a work in progress as well, so yeah. I'm not really sure. Yeah, but I think like we could... how much of this is going to be used. There's something but... like, you know, get property list. So we could have a script that, you know, scans for these and exposes yeah. them. You know, just talks to this to the uh, CVARS core yeah. service and says, OK, make me a bunch of these at, at this path. And yeah, I think it's. I think it'd be possible. Okay. Or it would be. I don't know. Maybe it would be easier to have this. Like. I don't know. I'm not sure yet. Yeah. Uh, ah, one more thing. So you can have you can have things. Yeah, one time assignment. Just use the CVAR ref name dot value. You can link property so it will automatically set something else for you. But you can also hook uh, a method. So we can do display name dot setter equals we can make a like a little function and this will do just print our uh, the text welcome message is now percent s percent and here we have value now if i run this i just saved i wonder if it's gonna something's gonna break maybe it won't yeah so now i should get you know <laughs> let's use all the tools now we should get uh Yep. Now we have our custom code being run every time. Or do we have it? No, we don't. I know why. Yeah. Because this is in a ready. This was this has to be run at start. Now it should be true. So we can have our console here. See where it are there. Display name, Robodop. Yeah, welcome messages now, blah, blah, blah. This is how we can make it so code runs every time this changes. I think there could be uses like maybe even with the radio system. Mm. We could have like a runtime <coughs> section for this where it's like, a space for CVARs that are like only exist during this match and mm -hmm. and 
it's used for communication between objects like this computer can you know like create some cvars and something else can like set values of it you know and it's, mm -hmm. it would be like a new folder would be runtime or something you know i don't know thinking of use yeah, cases it sounds like i'm like most uh thing most exported properties could be a cvar Yeah, and then ha, huh, these these could also be stored. So then, I can Im imagine like, for example, a single player uh, level that I don't know tracks like what's happened in it, and every time you load it, like things are a bit different because it has some CVARs that it like are saved through the CVAR system, mm. and like tracks like for example what. Mm, options of dialogue you've explored already and like tries to like suggest things that I don't know you haven't tried yet or something right right or a multiplayer game that has a you know a counter how many people went through a gate you know just mm -hmm. a number and that like this persistent it stays between you know server restarts and stuff mm -hmm. so it could be a way yeah, you to... can you can track stats in a, in a game as well like in a in a death match, you know, you can yeah. track like headshots and things like that. Yeah. Making runtime ones, that could be an interesting thing, because creating them from code is not very hard and can be made mm. even easier if we will yeah, find I guess users. That for would it. be server, right? In the server Seaver. category. Mm -hmm. Ah, you mean the yeah yeah stuff running on that affects the game state. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't implemented the access level in Cvars yet. For now, I just you know made them work, but now that they work, I can also work on the. Uh, on the access level and we can start thinking this i think we could do something to yeah because you know being able to have like this visual editor that you can open from the game and just you know click yeah, through really cool. yeah and change things on the fly mm -hmm. it's, it's really powerful like mm -hmm. yeah and because this is all yeah custom, I, I had no idea what you what you were thinking with this and now that i've seen it fully like yeah you cooked Oh yeah, that is, it took me some time. Cool. Yeah, I, 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 I like I was envisioning this. Yeah. And you've cooked. I've cooked and cooked and <laughs> yes. Um, I'll be right back. Okay. I think I will end the recording here, and if there's anything okay. more. No, that's I've got no more questions or anything yeah. like that. Okay. So for yeah, anything I'll... else there will be a next video. <laughs> yeah, I'll be right back. Okay. See ya. Bye. <clears throat>